the reason for which we have come, O oh God, is because we acknowledge our insufficiency. It is written that your spirit helps our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray as we ought. Our understanding of the nature of help we need is defective. And so we have come as an act of submission to you that you might look upon us with mercy, stretch forth your hand, and heal our infirmities. In the name of Jesus Christ, thank you, Lord, for seeing us through 2021, bringing us into 2022. We give you great praise. In 2021, we celebrated the first contact in another facility. And this is the first time we're standing on this soil to celebrate another contact. It is the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. We thank you, O oh God, in the name of Jesus. Be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. You are most welcome to the house of God. Hallelujah. If you study your Bible, you'll find out that God once and again sends prophets. People that have deep insight into the things of the Spirit to bring guidance to kings. In the cabinet of the nation of Israel, at any time where they had political health, the king was supported by a cutting edge prophet. Because uh, in order to steer the affairs of Israel forward, there is a need for the blueprint of God for the land to be understood. God normally strengthens and supports the office of the king, therefore, with a prophet. And whenever you find Israel declining, it is almost always because the king of that day refuses to submit to the standards of God as proclaimed by the prophet. The resultant effect is that the partnership between the king and the prophet will not prosper in that dispensation. And you are going to see the prophet begin another side of his ministry, lamentations. He will begin to cry out because there is no way that the land can stay on course without insights from God. Amos chapter 3. This is my way of saying Happy New Year. You must have seen that the caption of this, this month's edition of the contact conference is the prophetic verses. That's what we do every January. In the month of January, we go into hiding. We proclaim a long season of fast so that we can synchronize with the policy directions of heaven. And it is part of the duties of apostolic ministers to speak in simple, plain language and to point in the direction of God's emphasis. To bring to the believers of Jesus Christ, the present revelation position of the Spirit. God never begins, leads his people blind. And so we are trying to do something like navigation so that each and every one of us can stumble on the intent on the heart of God. There is a lot of guidance that finds expression in the testimony and the confirmation of one prophet and another prophet. And so we normally celebrate the first contact by having uh, some of the eagles in our company come together so that we can compare notes. Because part of uh, the nature of prophecy is that we preach in part and we, we prophesy in part. And so we are trying to put together the full um, possibilities of the jigsaw puzzle so that we can adequately um, design that which God is saying to the church. So in our midst is a, uh, a sample space of uh, our 
apostolic conclave. And we have uh, put up this conference in order for the body of Christ to adequately understand the things to expect and the strategies that we must adopt in order to survive. If you are still with me, say amen. So every January, every January, some other months we might congregate in a prophetic mood as God will, uh, based on God's instruction, but it is almost always default that in the month of January, we need to bring prophetic words to the people of God. In order to justify this approach, we need to do a few scriptures, uh, one of which will be Amos chapter number three. From verse 6, it says, shall a trumpet. Oh, no. Let, let's do Ecclesiastes first. Ecclesiastes chapter number 3. Just to show you the nature of God's scope of, scope of administration. The Bible says that to everything there is a season and to every time, uh, and to every time, and time to every purpose on the heaven. So if God wants to do something, he situates what he wants to do in a certain season. If God wants to do something, he situates what he intends to do in an appropriate time. And that's why it's not the day that a woman conceives that she gives birth. There is a procedure and a process. Even though what is happening to her is very real, it is concrete, there is life that is growing inside of her, but it needs to go through a full scope of gestation. And so even though God has spoken to you that he wants to do something, that thing is going to find expression in a season that God has situated. So God operates by season. And part of the responsibility of the prophet is to make known to the body of Christ the kind of season that is issuing forth. You see, we will not be effective ministers of the gospel if we lack the capacity to give direction. Because God never expects his people to be blind. There's enough illumination in the Holy Spirit to bring light to every single member of the body of Christ. And we have labored as watchmen for many, many years. And the Lord is making brighter the intensity of his grace upon our vessel. Now we owe the body of Christ a responsibility, which is to unveil the season. Because when you understand the season, then it will be easy for you to articulate the things that God has scheduled to find expression according to his sovereign will within the scope of the season. The season travels with the potential of possibilities and performances. The Bible says, blessed is she that believeth, for there shall be a performance of the things that God has told her. That performance is situated within a season. So this scripture shows us an administrative procedure of how God brings to pass the things that he intends to do. Are you still with me? All right, can we read as a congregation? Oh my God. They, there's no fire in this. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Let's try again. I say, are you with me? Yes, sir. Are you still dragging with 2021? You are missing the year or something. That's the way I see you feel now. But some of us are reaching to the stars, trying to fully <laughs> appropriate what God has in store. Hallelujah. All right. So this scripture is an administrative procedure. The fact that God visited with Abraham and gave him a prophecy. I mean, I don't mean a prophet. I say God came to Abraham and said, according to the time of life, your wife will conceive and she will give birth. I was expecting that because it was God, Sarah should begin to go on that label instantly. And God will bypass the procedure and the protocol. Even though it was God, he still said, according to the time of life. He domiciled the performance to a season. Please help me tell your neighbor, season. season. So part of what we came to do during the course of this conference is to proclaim the season. 
unfortunately, the kind of ministry we have received for so long in the mainstream quarters has fallen short of what it takes to bring direction to a people. We came under intense oppression and the gates of darkness opened unto us as a nation in the form of the reckless wickedness and the beast of darkness that has been walking our territory and taking blood. All of that happened and we were never warned. Hallelujah. People woke up and prayed the normal breakthrough prayers they normally pray. They didn't know that there was a breakdown on the way because they were never warned. Part of what the prophet needs to do is to warn us so that you will know when to take your journey. You will know when to stand. You will know when to sit. You will know when to walk away. And you will know when to run. May the Lord give you understanding. So a new generation of people that feel responsible to the body of Christ are beginning to grow. And these people that I speak of are determined to fully prosecute and implement the full dividend of service delivery that is consistent with the apostolic possibilities. So I want to read a scripture quickly in the book of Amos chapter 3, the scripture that I escaped from in order to read Ecclesiastes chapter 3 to give us perspective of God's administrative protocol. The omnipotent God, if he wants to do something, he secures it in a season. That's why all of us were not born the same day. Hallelujah. I say hallelujah. Amen. Now, how many of you in this room have seen up to 25 people that are your birthday mates all your life? Some of you are 47. Some of you are 50 years old. Some of you are 43 years old. Have you seen up to 25 people that are born on the same day that you were born? Maybe the older ones will help us. No matter... It's a justification of the fact that if God wants to do something, he domiciles it where? Sees. Now, we are here to understand the season. I'm just seeing someone in the congregation. That I'm not sure, but amen. Uh, my pastor is here. If you think I'm stubborn, you can go and report. This one of the people you can report to. Please, can you celebrate my pastor? If, if, you, if you believe I'm stubborn, maybe I do something wrong to you and you need somebody to report quickly. Don't travel. Just meet her and tell her. She knows how to tame me. I say, you sit down. This, this. She's not afraid of me, okay? So she's my pastor. She's here. Celebrate her one more time, woman. And I need to say this publicly. What I'm doing now, she may not even remember. She prophesied it um, how many years ago now? 16 years ago. 16 years ago, she prophesied every bit of what I am doing here. And during the course of the year, we'll have the pleasure of her presence to give us perspective. She actually has the gift of prophecy. Celebrate her again, my pastor, <laughs> Reverend Mrs. Anna King. Ecclesiastes chapter number 3, verse 6. Shall a trumpet be blown in the city, and the people not be afraid? Shall there be an evil in the city, and the Lord has not done it? Surely the Lord God will do nothing but he revealed his secrets unto his servants, the prophets. So what this conference is about is to bring the secrets that God has revealed to his servants. Hallelujah. I'm not the preacher for the night, but I need to justify why we are here and the purpose for which we came so that everyone's expectation will be connected to what God wants to deliver. If you are still with me, say amen. All right. Um, for those of you that are not aware, in the past few weeks, we've been dealing with something critical. And it's my humble opinion that the age, the age has changed. 
And right now we are in a new age in the civilizations of God. And the name of this age is different from what it used to be. The things that God blessed in previous movements will no longer be blessed by God at this time. And I call this age the age of the watchmen. So because of that, I've been doing a series of teaching about the watchmen. And if you have been following, you will know what I'm talking about. And just in case you are not following, um, the materials for this emphasis are domiciled on YouTube, and you are enjoined to seek them out. So before I bring the preacher for the night, I would use about 15 or 20 minutes to continue my teaching on the watchman. The intention is this, we need to transform every believer to become a watchman. And that is going to limit the activities of the devil in our territory. Hallelujah. Habakkuk chapter number 2. And the little exhortation I want to give us, which I'll be building on as we move in the conference, is developing the eye of the watchman. Developing the eye of the watchman. It's not a gift, it's developed. So turn your Bible to Habakkuk chapter 2, beginning from verse number 1. I'm going to continue in this parable of the watchman into February, maybe into March. The emphasis refuses to leave my spirit. Hallelujah. Developing the eye of the watchman. I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and I will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I will answer when I am reproved. This man is attempting to describe a very significant job description. He takes the time to explain to us in detail the kind of assignment that he has been given by God. He said, I will stand upon my watch. I need to use another translation to cause us to understand the burden that this functionary is trying to bring to our notice. So if you have technical people, do you have another translation? of the Bible, uh, let us, all right, so we have um, young literal translation. On my charge I stand and I will station myself on a bulwark. Hey. No, no. I will stand upon my watch. No, you see the reason for which I need other translations is to, um, there are two words in that scripture that I need other words for. The first word is watch. I will stand upon my watch. Okay, go back to KJV. Since we don't have any translation that can help us out adequately. Oh my. Go back to King James. Okay. Okay. All right, let me use my own uh, scripture. I'll go back to Habakkuk chapter number 2. I will stand upon my watch and set me upon my tower. Well, I went on some investigation today, and I found in the tesseros of the scripture uh, some more suitable words for the power words in that scripture. For instance, in the Tesaros, I found watchtower is the full word for uh, a watchtower is a noun, but a watch is a verb. All right? So he is trying to climb onto a watchtower. A watchtower is a thing. And this man is saying that I am laboring. 
to gain ascendancy to my watchtower. And that's what he said here. And then he says, I will set myself on the guard post. So there are two things here. We have the watchtower and there is a position that he needs to stand. That position is called the guard post. The reason for which he is ascending the watchtower is because he wants to get to the guard post. This watchtower that is, he is ascending to, when he arrives at the guard post, he has so much visibility. He can see the enemy when the enemy is approaching. Um, Pastor Jaffet, you are a security expert. You understand what I'm talking about. You need that positional advantage to have visibility, to have coverage. Meanwhile, he says that I am determined to stand upon, to ascend on the watchtower. Now, a lot of people are not determined enough to ascend the watchtower. So they never get to benefit from the coverage that comes from positional view. See, when you ascend the watchtower, then you can reach out to your guard post. <clears throat> the first question today, or the first answer today, is how do you ascend your watchtower? Meanwhile, don't get me wrong, if you don't ascend your watchtower, there are many things that will be happening that you will not have the eyes to view. The reason for which you are going up there is so that you can take advantage of all the visibility within the scope of the positional advantage. Just like someone that is standing in the gallery, can, he has positional advantage. And even in warfare, the guy that is on the mountain has an upper hand than the guy that is coming from the valley. You need to climb. He doesn't need to do anything. While you are attempting to master the climb, you are already in harm's way. So it's always an advantage for you to be able to mount your guard post. The prophet is saying, I'm, I'm going to mount my guard post. And the reason why he needs to do that because of the advantage that he gives in terms of visibility, in terms of warfare, in terms of a counterattack, resisting a counterattack. Just because he's on his guard post, he has all of the advantages that is required for him to deflect an enemy that is coming into range. So I, I need to tell us something quickly. If you are going to get that advantage, you need to know what it takes to mount your guard post. And it's a deliberate climbing effort for you to get to the place where all the advantages lend themselves to you adequately. Now, I need to take you to another scripture quickly to show you how you climb. Because so many people claim to be praying but their life is a description of defeat. Meanwhile, our God is not powerless. But in their lives, it seems as though God is powerless. And the reason is because where they are, they cannot see what is relevant to their warfare. Please help me tell your neighbor, encourage your neighbor, it's time to climb to your guard post. All right, I need to show you the climbing method. The climbing method is domiciled in the book of Psalms, chapter 24. I will take five more minutes after I've established that, and I'll be on my seat. Tomorrow, before the next preacher comes up, I will come again and give you a shot from the Word of God. Just a little shot that will put you on course. Hallelujah. <laughs> amen, amen, amen. Then on Sunday night, will bring the finger of God in healing and deliverance. Hallelujah. If, if you don't believe that there's something called the power of God, I invite you to come Sunday night and then look for a terrible situation that, it would, it, that defies doctors. And then we'll call upon the name of the Lord and ask him to heal and ask him to deliver. And uh, 
he will do what only him can do. Uh, what we do is to call him. Then when he shows up, he knows how to deal with the issues. Turn your Bible to the book of Psalms 24. The Bible says, The earth is the laws and the fullness thereof. The world and dead that dwell therein. For he had founded it upon the floods, upon the seas, and established it upon the floods. Stop there. Now, in, in the departments of government, there happens to be a department that is so popular in Benue State, it's called Lands and Survey. Lands and Survey is important because they are in custody of a certain register. That registry is the full, is the compendium of the names of individuals that own titles to land. The first place you need to go, just in case there is a land dispute, is to seek out access to the registry. Most people don't seek the registry until there is a land dispute. The registry is a quiet place until dispute comes, then it becomes a critical place, a very important location. Because issues pertaining to land ownership are domiciled there. Hallelujah. Psalms 24 verse 1 is land registry. And I said that, you know, people don't visit the land registry except there is a land dispute. If there is a land dispute in this scripture. The scripture begins by saying, the earth is the Lord's. Just in case you are confused. In the law of Nigeria, you own the land, but if you find oil in the land, it belongs to the government. But in the United States of America, you own the land and what is in the land. And this scripture is saying, I don't know what law you function with, but the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and them that dwell therein. So even you, you are the Lord's, whether you know it or not. But I pray you will not know it too late. It gives us evidence to show that the earth is the Lord's. The first evidence it presents is that for is the, the way God designed the earth. You know, when we were building this place, it was terribly waterlogged. And we were determined, we began the construction in rainy season. So the whole place was waterlogged. And I came with the engineers and we looked at it. I said, my God, this is bad business. The engineer said, no, you're not seeing properly. There's nothing here that we cannot change. It's only that it will cost us more money. And it's good we are building it in rainy season. When we conquer it in rainy season, we have nothing to worry about. I was seeing problems. They said, Pastor, we also walk in the rains. I thought we had to wait for dry. He said, no, we walk. We walk around the clock. And part of what they did was that. I, I've never seen that done, done before. They uh, made boxes. And they dog holes and put those boxes, connected iron rods and poured cement. And the water there, we make the cement solid and then they put the box. I, I've never seen that before. I don't know what the name was, but we conquered the place. If you have done anything like building construction, maybe you do it in the riverine area, you will know that water is an obstacle. And in order for you to build something that is solid, you will do stuff like sand filling, look for a way to drain the water out. Water is always a challenge if you want to cast. Now, part of the evidences that were presented that the earth is the Lord's is the way God designed the earth. Whereas the civil engineer would want to take the water out and to sand fill the place or dredge the place. God decided to found the earth on the seas. I don't know how he... I don't, I don't know how he succeeded in doing that. But the Bible says he established it upon the seas and founded it upon the floods. I know how we fought the floods on this ground for us to have a decking that even Satan 
in all his aggression cannot compromise. Hallelujah. Because Satan was against us from start to finish. He was looking for an opportunity to manifest himself. So that we say Satan. We didn't call Satan throughout. We didn't call him. So when we built the whole place and we didn't call his name, he waited for cross overnight and he stood on a generator. <laughs> Satan is bad on Sundays, bad on Mondays. He's bad every day. Such a terrible fellow. I, I, we would like to see him, but not now. <laughs> the Bible says that God founded the earth upon the floors. He established it upon the seas. He did not only show that by records of land registry, the earth is the laws. He also showed us that it is the laws because he actually designed it. And do you know there's a, a civil engineering flaw in that design? Because the earth is sitting on water. No engineer that wants a house to last builds on water. And that is to say that God intended from the beginning that this civilization will not be a continuing existence. It's a, pump, it's a temporary establishment. So he allowed that civil engineering flaw. And that's the reason why if you, if you dig deep enough, you will find water in the earth. That's how the boreholes work. Because there's water under there. Just keep digging, you'll strike it. That's a major flaw in the construction because God was not expecting us to be in this place as a continuing civilization. Now that we have established that the earth is the Lord's in two ways, land registry and by construction, then the real issue is about to be revealed in the book of Psalms 24. When I establish the real issue, I will take my seat. But we are doing this to show you how to climb. Because the guy says, I'm going to climb on my tower. I'm going to take my place as a guard. Are you with me? I need the height. I need the positional advantage for me to see the things that I need to see that are relevant in prosecuting my duties as a watchman. The next scripture, which is verse 3, says, who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Now, this is the climbing. Just wanted to show you what you need in order to climb. Because many of you have been praying, and somebody say, I've been praying for, for how many years? For seven years, nothing changed. You've been praying blind. It's high time you began to see. And we are trying as much as possible to give you insight into how to develop the watcher's eye. See, the Bible says, who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? I was expecting names like a register. James, John, Franklin, and Martha. But what I see here are not names. What I see here are traits. It's a he that has clean hands. In this lecture today, I would have labeled to show you what happens to a man that doesn't have clean hands trying to partake in the enterprise of God. As strategic as David was in the agenda of God in his day, he attempted to build a temple. And it was a laudable desire. The prophet approved of it instantly. But when the prophet went to seek the face of God, God excluded David from the project. And the reason was because his hands were filled with blood. Meanwhile, his duty was to provide territorial integrity for the nation and which he did in, with excellence. But unfortunately, because of the line of duty he had to labor, he had to be excluded from some other matters. If you, uh, you say you want to mount up to your tower, you are, is going, you are going to be too heavy for the climb if your hands are in out of order. I worked in the oil industry, for God's sake. There were opportunities. I, I was the supervisor of all the vessels that brought petroleum products to Nigeria in Beachland. I was the king of Beachland. My stamp was the power of Nigeria. There was no power like that. If you, if you have ever labored in the oil industry, there was no power like that stamp. People tremble when I, when I come to work. They tremble. Oh, I 
Hallelujah. <laughs> and I knew the market, the market implication of having that stamp. I labored for 16 years, never used that stamp for corruption. The reason is because I wanted to be able to mount to the tower. Hey, many of you have exchanged your possibility of attaining and ascending. He said, who shall ascend? The force of gravity will bring you down if your hand is not in order. May God help you not to have a fat pocket and a broken heart. In the name of Jesus Christ. I want to tell you, all those of you in this auditorium, because many of you have not seen enough money. If you see dollars, new ones, in a gym test bag, and they open it to you, sister, I assure you, you, are, you don't know what you will do. Yeah, you look pious, sanctimonious, and sacramental. When you look upon dollars, if you smell it, the new notes, you sniff it in, and you still say, thank you, Jesus, you are saved. I come elike. He said, who shall I say? That was why names were not mentioned, because there were no, no people... There were no people in that category. But in case you are interested, he that has... What? The challenge is this. Because God may not be willing to show you anything if your hands are not in order. So there's no need for you to ascend. Because it will be a venture of futility. He spoke about the hands, he that has clean hands, and a pure heart. He spoke about the work of your soul who has not lifted his soul in vanity or sworn deceitfully. I, I don't have time, but I will have time. He said, That's, those are the category of people that can ascend the heel of God. This thing we are talking about will affect your hand, it will affect your soul, it will affect the commitments you have made. Maybe you have sworn to vanity. The, the, the force of gravity will stop you from ascending. And that's why the ranks of the watchmen are depleted. That's why we lack true power as a company. That's why for a long time, in the body of Christ in this nation, you will hardly hear somebody warning and saying, danger is coming. And this is what we need to do to stop the beast. Because men are discouraged. To mount the tower. But I tell you, I bring you a message. The day of the watchman has come, and so we don't have a choice. We need to clean those hands up. Those hearts must be brought back into alignment. Your soul must not desire vanity. Oh, I remember there was a preacher among us those days, so anointed of God. But he kept saying something, that he was born into a poor family, that he will never die poor. Oh, even when he preaches, when he goes high in the Holy Ghost, he says, I was born into poverty, but I decided. He never knew that that thing, that goal was an idol. And as long as his soul was lifted up to that vanity, he will always miss God. Eventually, he got the wealth. And most of it was not, was through manipulation. It was not wealth given from the Lord. It was wealth he seized because of the vanity that was upon his soul. And because of that wealth, he missed God and didn't know. So when he became old, he was still in the wealth. But what made him relevant, the glory of God, departed many, many years ago. And he knew he made the wrong choice. He died blind. He said, what your soul has kissed is going to affect your usefulness on the tower. It will affect your climbing. It will, it will put you in a position where visibility will not be available. Because the idols of your heart will block your, your heart from, from sight. Visibility will be taken from you. Hallelujah. We'll continue from here tomorrow. Don't forget the topic is, what's the topic? Developing the eyes of a watchman.
If you follow the step-by-step -step procedures I'm going to give you, oh my God, we will become a company of seers. I know the reason for which you may need sight is to predict the next president. I assure you, God will give you that and give you more. We have seen much more than that. And what is about to play out now, we saw it years ago. We have left what is about to happen this year in our sight, in our watchings. We have seen far beyond that. And I'm not saying we saw because we are prophets. I am saying we saw it because we are believers and we have the Holy Ghost. The Bible says when he, he the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak of himself. But that which he hears the Father say, that's what he's going to say unto you. And the Bible says, he will show you things to come. That's his nature. He's not stuck in time. There is no past or present or future with him. There is a perpetual now in the scope of his own reality. And anytime you tap into him, oh my, there's always breaking news coming out of his bowels. And I pray that we will not be blind. Part of what God wants to give us is the sight of a watchman. Once again, I welcome you to the new age. The golden age is the age of the watchers. And it is our responsibility, therefore, to train every one of us to become a watchman within his jurisdiction and the gates to which he's appointed. To take